Good morning, church. Good morning, Elder. Good morning. Happy Sabbath to each and every one. Good morning to you. Good morning to you. Can everybody hear me okay? Yeah, happy Sabbath. Happy yeah. Sabbath. You guys pray for me as I pray for myself. It's a privilege always to, to stand before God's people. Amen. Amen. Um, I've been thinking about this topic for a while and the last time I stood here we talked about justification and sanctification <clears throat> and we kind of try to put it in context of uh, people as Seventh-day Adventist Christians, amen? amen. And I, I made some statements and I said um, one of the things that I find in Adventism is that uh, we tend to focus on sanctification. We kind of passed over justification and we spend a lot of time focused on sanctification. And there's reasons why we have arrived at this place. Uh, I'm not gonna go over the history again. Um, but lately I've been, actually I've been with a, on a Bible study with uh, a group of Adventists and, and I would say supposedly Adventist ministers and I was disheartened by what I was hearing um, a lot of, to me, they more seem like former Adventists than Adventists, and a lot of that, it's good for me that I have been researching and I have done a lot of reading and a lot of the writings and stuff of former Adventists, and it, it's a pity that they don't really seem that they're actually fulfilling prophecy. Uh, so the Lord tells us that there will be the former Adventists who will be the most the vicious enemies. critics of the Adventist message. But today I want to, uh, uh, there was a couple expressions that I coined the last time. I said, uh, justified is what we are and sanctified is what we're becoming. And I'm becoming more convinced of this concept. But today I want you to bow your heads with me as we pray and we look into this topic. The, in, and to 2,300 days. You're, You're muted. muted yourself. Oh. Uh, I saw the mute thing went out, so somebody may have muted everyone and muted me also. So our message today is entitled, Unto 2,300 Days, uh, The Investigative Judgment Doctrine in the Light of Justification by Faith. If you bow your heads with me for a minute. Heavenly Father, we thank you again for being our God and our friend and for the privilege of being a part of your eternal family. And we thank you for the invitation, Lord, to become a part of your family. And we're thankful that you have declared to us that we are accepted in the beloved, your son, our elder brother, Jesus the Christ. We ask, though, Heavenly Father, that you'll forgive us sins where we have fallen short. I pray that you will open our minds give us understanding, not only for ourselves, but that we might be able to communicate these truths to others that they too may find hope and that they may come to know the, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you sent. For this you declare is eternal life. Thank you to the same strengthen or retention, I pray. In Jesus' holy name, amen. 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 And to 2,300 days, the investigative judgment in the light of justification by faith. 
Our scripture comes to us from 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 9 through 11. By the way, uh, as a people, we have been criticized by a lot of non-Adventist scholars for this view, this idea of this judgment. You know, people say, well, why does God need to judge? God knows everything, and that's true. But the one of the beautiful things about our message is that we always need to take our message. Our message are always couched in the context of the great controversy. That's always the backdrop, the great controversy. So yes, there is a judgment. We find that the Bible is very clear in, in Scripture, Second Corinthians chapter 5, our scripture for today, verses 9 through 11. The Bible says, therefore, we make it our aim whether present or absent, to be well-pleasing to him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. So that's very clear, amen? If you turn with me to Romans chapter 14, there's some more texts on that subject. Romans chapter 14 Romans chapter 14 and verses 10 if you're there you can give me a thumbs up I know you're we're together everyone can still hear me fine yes okay yes praise the Lord if there's any time you can't hear me, please let me know. So Romans chapter 14, verse 10, the word of God goes on to say, But why dost thou judge thy brother? Or why dost thou set up not thy brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. So again, that's clear. Uh, one more text I want to give you. First Peter chapter 4 and verses 17. First Peter chapter 4. And verses 17. Where's my friend Peter? First Peter chapter 4 and verses 17. The word of God goes on to say, For the time is now that judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it first began, begin at us. What shall the end of them that obey not the gospel of God? So Peter is giving us another insight here is that that judgment will begin where? At the house of God. So the judgment is actually in phases. And the first phase of the judgment, God is dealing with his people, amen, those who profess to be is and those who have joined themselves to his cause. So judgment begins in the house of God. Um, there's another text um, that I didn't have here, but it's fun just to, again, to emphasize that there is a judgment and that there is a time. You can't hear? Can you hear me now? I'll try not to move. Thank you, Sister Margie. I'll, I'll keep an eye on you so you can let me know. Sometimes I like to move around and I, I'm kind of trying to figure out where my microphone is on the computer. So there's another text found in Acts chapter 17 and verse 31. And I will just read uh, Acts chapter 17, 31. The New International Version says, For he has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed. He has given proof of this to everyone by raising him from the dead. So the Bible says that God has appointed himself a day when he will judge the world by the man, Jesus Christ. Amen? So we are indeed on solid grounds when we say there is going to be a judgment. And that brings us to our, this idea of 1844 and to 2,300 days. And there are other texts, right, brothers and sisters, the Bible and the three angels' messages. The Bible says the first angel flying in the midst of heaven, saying, Fear God and give him glory. Why? For the hour of his judgment is come. And worship him who made the heavens and the earth, the seas and the springs of water. So it's very clear 
that God has appointed himself when, he, when judgment is going to commence. And then we get a little bit more detail. However, what I've decided to do for those who are visiting and listening and probably not familiar with our doctrines, I want to do a quick overview of the prophecies of how this 2300 days comes into perspective for Seventh-day Adventists and its reference as this investigative judgment or pre-Advent judgment that we talk about. In Daniel 2, um, we have the introduction of the four world kingdoms. I'm just going to kind of go through some stuff out there if you want to take your notes, um, if you're not familiar. Uh, by the way, I, uh, I just want to put this in here. Um, I think what we really need to do is start like a Bible study and Sabbath afternoons, because what I have noticed in my experience with this group that I'm studying, even though these people are seven-day Adventists, and they were born into the church, actually. It seems to me that they, they're in the church, but they don't really know what we believe. They kind of know and hear the doctrines, but they don't understand what we believe, why we believe, and they really can't defend themselves. So I was kind of shocked when I find they were capitulating so quickly to these new ideas that were being introduced. And, you know, they weren't able to go to the scripture. You know, I was on the line and I was constantly be throwing out some scripture. Well, what about this scripture? And then, you know, the individual will try to try to brush it off and, and try to claim enlightenment and, and being theologians. And I was like, you know, I had my own defense for that. I'm like, well, wait a minute. You know, I said at one moment, I said, actually, it was the theologians of Jesus' time that put him on the cross. So don't tell me you have a PhD in theology and that gives you the right to tell me what the word of God is saying because it was those very same people that put Jesus on the cross. So if that, if I start using that kind of reasoning, and if you were so educated and enlightened, then you should have known who Jesus was, amen? I'm just trying to make it clear that, you know, education is good, but education is information. And what the world claims as education, we are all educated every day we learn new things. And today with the internet, we can self-educate, we can get information. And I say, and I'm going to say this again, a well-educated person who is devoid of understanding is a dangerous individual, especially when it comes to the things and the word of God. Amen? But the Bible is very clear that spiritual things are what? Spiritually discerned. And so I had to give a defense for myself and for the doctrines of the church. The Bible also says that it's the same anointing, the same anointing that inspired the writers of the Word of God is the same anointing that will give us understanding. Amen? The Word of God goes on to say again that if any man lack wisdom, let him what? Let him ask of God who gives it and abrade it. So the Word of God is very clear that, you know, you don't have to have a PhD in theology to understand the things of God. Amen. So we, look at, we look at Daniel chapter 2 and we have these four world kingdoms that are presented the statue that Daniel, that King Nebuchadnezzar saw, and it's divided into four, the head of gold, the, the, the brass, and the, 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 um, the, the, the legs, and then the iron, and we know it represents the four kingdoms, Babylon, Media, Persia, Greece, and Rome. And then we come to Daniel chapter 7, and we understand that the prophecies are presented in what we call a chaotic form. It's, in, it's repeat and enlarged. So in Daniel 7, God gives Daniel then the same vision that he gave Nebuchadnezzar with more, more details. He saw seven beasts coming out of the sea. And the Bible explained what the sea represents. And the beast is a kingdom or a power. And we go on. So in, in Daniel uh, chapter 7, verses 3 through 7, we get the four world kingdoms. And then in Daniel chapter 9 through 10, we have this introduction of the of the, uh, of the judgment. If you want to turn with me there, uh, briefly, we're going to try and cover this. Daniel chapter 7. If you turn with me to Daniel chapter 7. Detail. So in Daniel chapter 7, verses 9 and 10, we have the introduction of the judgment. Amen? The Word of God says, put my glasses on here. The Word of God says, and I beheld, 
till thrones were cast down and the ancient of days did sit whose garment was white as snow and the hair of his head like pure wool his throne was like a fiery flame and his wheels as burning fire there's something that we need to understand here always in god's presence it seems there's always fire amen to say a fiery stream issued and came forth from before him thousand thousands ministered unto him and ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him the judgment was set and the books were open so we have this concept very clear that the judgment is set um so in in a judgment in a trial we we're familiar with how trials are run. There's three phases. There's a trial. So we have the trial in verses 9 through 10. And if you drop down with me uh, to verses 21 and 22, we're still in Daniel 7, verses 21 and 22. We have the verdict. Amen? Three phases to the judgment. We have the trial, the verdict, and then we have the execution of the verdict, right? Or the execution of the judgment whatever where, where justice is now is going to be handed out so in daniel 7 21 and 22 the bible says i beheld on the same horn that horn made war with the saints and prevailed against them until the ancient of days came and judgment was given to the saints of the most high and the time that the saints possess the kingdom so we have the verdict and then we have uh, the execution of the judgment, which is found in Daniel 7, 26 and 27. If you drop down with media, Daniel 7, 26 and 27, the Bible says, But the judgment shall and they shall take away his dominion to consume and to destroy it unto the end, and the kingdom and the dominion and the greatness of the kingdom under the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High whose kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and all dominions shall serve and obey him. So here we have this concept of the judgment. I'm just going through this for those of us who are not familiar with the prophecies that we do indeed stand on solid ground because most non-Adventist Christians say, well, why, like I said, why in need of a judgment? They think that the judgment is going to happen when Jesus comes. But the Bible is very clear. Jesus says in Revelation, he says, Lo, I come, and my reward is what? My reward is with me to give every man according to his work shall be. So when Jesus comes the second time, he comes, the Bible says, not, to, not for salvation, but to execute the judgment. He comes with his reward. Obviously, if he comes with his reward, then the decisions have already been made. Amen? He's not come to make a decision. He's come to execute the decision that was made prior to his second coming. So uh, we, then we look at Daniel chapter 8. Daniel chapter 8. And if you'll turn with me to Daniel chapter 8, we have uh, in Daniel chapter 8, it's the same idea of repeat and enlarge. Only this time in Daniel chapter 8, only two kingdoms are referenced in the beginning. And if we read uh, Daniel 5 through 8, we're trying to connect this to 2,300 days on how we arrived at this idea. So in Daniel 8, um, in chapter 3, and then I'll start reading from verse 1. It says, in the third year of the reign of King Belshazzar, a vision appeared unto me, even unto me, Daniel, after that which appeared unto me at first. And I saw in a vision, and it came to pass, when I saw that I was at Shushan in the palace, which is in the province of Elam, and I saw in a vision, and I was by the river Uli. Then I lifted up my eyes and saw, and behold, there stood before the river a ram, which had two horns, and the two horns were high, but one was higher than the other, and the higher came up last. Now we know from studying Daniel's chapter uh, seven, with the the bear, the the this 
we will find as we read later that this ram represents the kingdom of Media and Persia, and it had two horns, like the bear in Daniel's vision in chapter 7, which also represent Media Persia, and the Bible says it came up and it was on one side. And we know that represent because there was two kingdoms, it was the Medes and the Persian, it was a co-rulership, but in the end, the Persians were more, took the preeminence over the Medes. And so here we see again, God is giving us that same insight that the ram has two horns, but one of the horns is higher than the other horn, amen? So there's a lot we can learn. And God is very, these words are not here just because we, God has given us an insight into the future and to history. He says, and I saw the ram pushing westward and northward and southward, southward. So we're looking at verses four. Um, so that no beast might stand before him, neither was there any that could deliver out of his hand, but he did according to his will and became great. So this is the kingdom of Media Persia, the first kingdom that is dealt with in Daniel 8. Um, then we have Daniel 5 through 8. The second kingdom is introduced. If you drop with me, Dung, and I saw, and I, as I was considering, behold, an he goat came from the west and the face of the whole earth and touched not the ground, and the goat had a notable horn between his eyes. So this one has one notable horn. And he came to the ram that had two horns, which I had seen standing before the river, and ran into him with fury of his power. So, and I saw him came close unto the ram, and he was moved with collar against him, and smote the ram, and brake his two horns, and there was no power in the ram to stand before him. But he cast him to the ground and stamped upon him, and there was none that could deliver the ram out of his hand. Therefore the he-goat waxed very great, and when he was strong, the great horn was broken. So here we have another picture of this new kingdom, and we will see as we, um, as we read a little bit more, if, you, if we keep reading, that the angel Gabriel gave Daniel an explanation to these visions, uh, this, this picture here, and he told him that the ram represent Media Persia and the goat represent uh, Greece, and that the notable horn was its first king, and it was broken in its strength. So there's a lot of details that the Bible has given us here. We know that the notable horn represent Alexander the Great, and the Bible said he was, the horn was broken in its strength. History tells us that Alexander died in his youth, amen, when he had just basically conquered the known world, he couldn't conquer it himself and he died. Uh, history says, some historian says from, you know, drunken debauchery. Um, I don't think that's really too important to us. The fact is that he died when he was young, when he had just completed his conquest. Just like the Bible says, the horn was broken when it was in its strength. And out of it, four notable horns came up. And history tells us that when Greece when Alexander died, his kingdom was given to his four generals, and those are details of the prophecy that we don't have to get into. But we want to drop down to verses 13 and 14. The explanation is given between um, in verses 13 and 14. We have this new introduction. It says, if you dare let me hear say amen, verses 13 and 14. Um, Thank you, Sister Margie. The Bible says, Then I heard one saint speaking, and another saint said unto the certain saint which spake, How long shall the vision concerning the daily sacrifice and the transgression of desolation to give both the sanctuary and the host to be trodden underfoot? So before that, the Bible had talked about one of these, in the, one of these individuals that came out of one of the horns, how he magnified himself, verse 11. Say, yeah, he magnified himself even to the prince of the host, and by him the daily sacrifice was taken away, and the place of his sanctuary was cast down, and a host was given him against the daily sacrifice by reason of transgression, and it cast down the truth to the ground, and it practiced and prospered. So the Bible is saying that there was a power that came into existence that tend to downtrod the truth. 
And we know what that, that is the truth about the gospel and of Jesus Christ. Amen. So in verse 13, the Bible says that Daniel was signing all this. And of course, you know, then he saw these two saints talking. And then this one said to the other, how long will this go on? This, how long will this power be allowed to, to do as it please? And it says, unto 2,300 days, then the sanctuary shall be cleansed, which is the topic that we're dealing with today. A seven-day Adventist, we understand this cleansing of the sanctuary is tied to the old Levitical and Old Testament and the sanctuary service that it represents judgment. So in Daniel 8, 15 through 25, we have Gabriel giving the explanation for the vision that Daniel had. Amen? And he told him, you know, the ram represent media Persia and the goat was, um, was, was Grisha. However, we have in, if you drop down with me, to verses 26 and 27, we find something very interesting going on here. And so the Bible says, and the vision of the evening and the morning which was told is true. Wherefore, this is the angel Gabriel speaking to Daniel. It says, wherefore shut thou up the vision for it shall be for what? For many days. So Daniel, the Gabriel told Daniel, because of course Daniel, as we read and we understand, Daniel was really perplexed with the vision because, you know, the sanctuary was mentioned. And as we keep reading, as we study, uh, this is just a quick overview. Um, for most of us, we have studied this as Seventh-day Adventist Christians. For those who are visiting with us and not familiar with our doctrines and our approach to prophecy may not be so familiar. So we have here that Daniel was perplexed because, of course, Daniel was in captivity at this time. And... The Bible says that the time was coming, the fulfillment of the prophecy of the 70 years of captivity was coming to an end as depicted by the prophet. And Daniel, I think I believe it was Jeremiah. Yeah. And so Daniel was now concerned because here he was told that the, here's this mention of the sanctuary and there's 2300 days and him understanding prophecy, I guess he saw it all the way in the future. So he was perplexed. And he, there was some anxiety, and he, as we study, we understand there was some underlying stuff. He was beginning to wonder if God had changed his mind about restoring Israel and Jerusalem and the sanctuary like he had promised, since they were now in Babylonian captivity. So we have verses 26 and 27. The angel said, and the vision of the evening and the morning which was told is true, wherefore shut thou up the vision, for it shall be for many days. And the Bible says, and I, Daniel, fainted and was sick certain days. It says, afterward, I rose up and did the king's business, and I was astonished at the vision, but none understood it. Now, here's some, some perplexity for us right here, because Daniel says, I was astonished at the vision, but none understood it. So what is he saying? Because if we read between 15 and 25, Gabriel gave him some explanation. Amen. So we will see as we go a little farther, we move into Daniel 9. That again, an overview, we see Daniel praying. And in Daniel 9, 1 through 19, we have this eloquent prayer. Daniel praying, confesses his sin, his sin and the sins of his people and requesting an understanding of the vision. So we come to Daniel 9, 20 to 27, and Gabriel answer and an introduction of the time of the appearance of the long-awaited Messiah, the Prince, is where this is introduced. So here is where we know and understand um, this perplexity that Daniel had in verses 27, where it says, no one understood the vision or what vision he was talking about. Well, in Daniel... Uh, in Daniel 8, um, I believe, in Daniel 8, when he had the vision, Daniel 8, 2, uh, as we do some word study, I mean, to make the connection, we find out that the word used for vision in Daniel 8, 2, uh, it actually the word uh, chazon, or chazon, which means literally it's a big vision. But we find that in Daniel um, 8.27, if we make that comparison, that word comparison, in Daniel 8.27, the word used for vision there is mare, which is basically a little vision or a vision within a vision. 
So from doing a little word study and going into the original text, we can glean some more deeper understanding of why his perplexity and what he's saying when he said that no one understood the vision. He's referring basically to the Mare, to the 2300 days, because the, the Chazon was explained. And it's clear from the text that he saw, you know, who was a ram and who was a goat. And there were some details there that we're not getting into today. We're just trying to make this connection because this is where a lot of scholars, I have studied this intensely. I've studied uh, commentaries from other non-Adventist scholars, and we are not the only one that hold these views, but most non-Adventist scholars does not make this connection because today we find that most theologians, uh, they hold to the prophetic interpretation of what we refer to as futurism. And I'm not gonna get into the whole history and how futurism came into view, but there's really three distinct approach to prophecy. There's futurism, preterism, and the historical approach. And that's what we as Seventh-day Adventists, we're historicists. So we use, the his, we use history because we say, if prophecy is history written in advance, then to understand prophecy, we simply got to go and look at history, amen, and start putting the pieces together. Futurism claims that most of the prophecy is for some time in the future when this Beast is going to come. Everybody here have heard about the mark of the beast, and he's going to be sometime in the future. Just giving you guys a quick overlay here that Jesus is going to come, and the saints are going to be raptured, and it's going to be a secret rapture, and people are just going to disappear. And then there's going to be seven years of tribulation, and then Jesus is going to come again. And during this seven years of tribulation, the ones who don't get their life right are going to have an opportunity again to choose, and God is going to raise up the Jewish nation and eh, my friends it is really a bunch of conjecture and unfounded it's not founded in the word of God Amen. Amen. but I'm not gonna I'm not gonna get into the details of how futurism preterism came about that's for another study because we'll be here all afternoon amen but that's one of the beautiful amen. things of being a seven-day Adventist Christian my friend I'm not saying this to be uh, to be puffed up, but this is the information that all of us as Seventh-day Adventist Christian have at the tip of our fingers. We are privileged people, amen? We have, God has blessed us with this abundance of information. There's a book that I'll recommend for those who really want to study this idea and get it real clear. It's a book written by Re Leroy Froome. It's called The Prophetic Fate of Our Fathers. Come on, Elder. It deals with this thing about um, preterism and futurism and how it came into being and the motives behind it and you know I recommend that you need to study the Bible says and show yourself approved like I said what I have learned in this Bible study that I was I was dismayed the fact that you have people who were born into the Seventh-day Adventist Church were so willing to capitulate their views and to accept these fanciful ideas that was given them because oh, I realized that they didn't really know what they believed mm -hmm. see the Bible says that we must be ready at all times to give what? A reason for the hope that is within us. So we need yes, to sir. study. The Bible also tells us, right? Study and show ourselves approved. A workman need not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And I say that, and I always say this, I wonder why God said a workman need not be ashamed because we don't want to come up and find out that we have been duped, amen, by people who claim to be enlightened, Come but instead they Come have prostituted now. and they have butchered the word of God, amen, to their own demise. And if we, like sheep, are not paying attention, we will just follow without looking. You know, when Paul was preaching, he commended the Bereans, amen? He said he, they were noble because what did they do? They did not just take Paul's word, but the Bible says they went and they studied the scripture to yes, see... Sir. And to check to make sure that what Paul was saying was in sync with the word of God. Amen? Yes, sir. So just don't take my word for it. And that's the reason why when I stand here before you, most of the time, I don't try to give you my own reasoning. I use the word of God. No, no. Now, here is something else that I have learned since I've been in the Bible study. You know, they, people, when they want to... When they want to deceive you, they use all kind of big words, right? I heard exegesis and homiletics and all this stuff. Well, you know what? Exegesis is simply, you know, 
studying the Word of God and try to glean from its context. And we as Seventh-day Adventists, we use what we call the, gramma the historical grammatical method of exegesis. So we look at the Word of God, we, we, look, we look at the historical setting, we look at the culture, the time, and what the message was and who the message was for. I mean, this is, this is good and proper exegesis. But there, there's also what we call exegesis. And this person that I've been listening to, he, he's claimed that about exegesis, but he's really into exegesis. Exegesis is when you come and you subject the word to your own reasoning. And then also there's another method of this, of this exegesis and homolytics, and it's called, I have, listen, my brother and sister, I have friends in the Adventist church who are well-educated and who are leaders in this church, amen? And there is a tendency for some brethren to use what we call today higher critical thinking. Well, that's dangerous because what it does, then the word of God is subject to one's reason. Oh, yeah. So, but I'm going to go on ahead here, amen? I'm not here to preach, I'm here to teach today. So we read and we continue and we're saying that this word in Daniel 2, this chazon, and then we find out that in Daniel 27, the word for vision is mare. So we know that there's a vision within a vision and we come to Daniel 9.20. So here's the connection. In Daniel 9, in Daniel 9 we come uh, when Daniel has prayed and he's asking for understanding. And if you come with me now to Daniel 9.20, 23. Turn with me to Daniel 9.23. We're going somewhere with this, amen. We're just trying to lay a foundation for those amen, of us right who, here. Amen, Elder. Those of us who are familiar, this is, just, this is just a rehearsal for those of our friends who are listening. This is just an introduction. So here we go, 9.23. Daniel 9.23, if you turn with me, the Bible says, at the beginning of thy supplication, this is Gabriel speaking, well, we'll start from verses 21. This is Daniel speaking. So remember, Daniel's prayer is Daniel 1 to 20. So Daniel, in Daniel 9, 21, remember there was no chapters in the Bible. This was done by the translators in, to help us, but there's one uniform connectivity in the, chap, in, the, in the book. Amen. So the Bible says in Daniel 9, 21, it says, Yea, while I was speaking in prayer, this is Daniel speaking, right? Even the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision at the beginning, Daniel, in the beginning of the chapter, in Daniel 8, he's talking about, being caused to fly swiftly, touch me about the time of the evening oblation. There's a lot of details here that we're not going to get into, talking about even oblation, amen? For those of us who are familiar with the sanctuary teaching, teaching this should be, you know, just be jumping out of us, the evening oblation. Oblation, that's right. Yeah. And he informed me and talked with me and said, Oh, Daniel, this is Gabriel now speaking, I am now come. For an understanding. At the beginning of thy supplication, thou art greatly beloved, therefore understand the matter and consider the vision. I hope you can hear me. I have a message here on my screen saying that my internet is unstable. We can hear you, Elder. You sound great. Good. So the Bible says here, um, at the beginning, so Daniel says here, at the beginning of thy supplication, the commandment came forth, and I am now come to show thee, for thou art greatly beloved, Therefore, understand the matter and consider the vision. Well, guess what word is used here for the vision? It's the same word used in Daniel 8, 27. Uh, um, it's the mare. So it's very clear to us from a word study, this tie between Daniel 9 and Daniel 8. And the angel is very clear. I have now come to give the understanding concerning this 2300 days vision that was mentioned in the first part of the text. Yes, sir. And then he goes on. And now here is the introduction. We say in this introduction, I say is the appearance of the long awaited Messiah, the Prince, and all biblical scholars agree on this, this 70 week prophecy. But unfortunately, most of them do not make the connection with the 2300 days. But here again in our word study, we can make that connection 
the word of God says, the, the angel says, 70 weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sin, and to make reconciliation for iniquity, and to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up the vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. Brothers and sisters, the word used here in the King James Version, determined, the Hebrew word here is shatak. What it means literally is to be amputated or to be cut off. So then one has to ask oneself, cut off or amputated from what, right? You can't cut something off from nothing. Amen? So as we use our reasoning power here that God has given us and from our word study, we can determine from the from the, the Mare introduction and this determined, this chatak, that the angel now make an introduction and he says, 70 weeks are determined upon thy people. And here is where we get this beginning of the, seven, of the 2300 days. He said, from the going forth, and then we find that farther in the text, the Bible says, it says um, from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem, unto Messiah, and of course, we, this is not our study for today, but he goes on, and we know that that date, according to historical date, is 457 BC. And if we go from 457 BC, amen, it brings us to the atom of 1844, and this is this 1844, and to 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. And that is how Adventists believe and understand that the judgment or Jesus started this final phase in the plan of redemption. Here's another thing also, brothers and sisters, we know that sometimes we have been criticized. I'm doing a little apologetic today for the Seventh-day Adventist Church, amen, is that sometimes we're accused of not understanding the atonement because most evangelicals, Christians believe that the atonement was completed at the cross. We believe because of our understanding of the sanctuary message and the sanctuary service that the atonement began with the life, with the appearance and the life of Jesus Christ. And the first part is the, and his death on the cross because we have the, that, that was a courtyard experience, amen? That's where the, the, the sacrifice was made. And that's where we got to understand this justification by faith idea, amen? This concept that God introduced that we're justified by faith. And that's one of the things that we really have to understand. And I believe sometimes, brothers and sisters, because of the details of our understanding, that sometimes the way how we present our messages seems to be works-oriented. And again, I said, because of our past and the rejection of the 1888 message of righteousness by faith, that we have focused too much on sanctification. And so people are caught up with performance and always we're watching each other, amen, because, of course, when it comes to performance, the only way we can check ourselves is by looking at others, right? Because if we look to God, we are hopeless. But when we look to others, we get some confidence because we can see that maybe I'm doing better than my brother A or my sister B over there. So that's, that's legalism. It's just another sophisticated way the devil may trick us into having a legalistic understanding of what God is trying to do for us. No, brothers and sisters, we are saved by grace through faith, not of works, lest any man should boast. Come on now. Servant of the Lord tells us in the Desire of Ages, friends, I don't have the quotation for you, but believe me, you can go and look it up. She says, in the robe of righteousness that we wear, that we, there will be, and I want you to listen to this carefully, there will be not one thread of human effort. Not one thread of human effort. God is very clear, amen? When we stand on the sea of glass, we will stand there solely on the merits of his son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We are saved, brothers and sisters, because we are justified, not because we are being sanctified. The fact is, is that we are being sanctified because we were first justified. And justification, I say, is a declaration that God has declared us. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 1, 
go back and study it again. Remember, when we study the Bible now, we must study it through the lens or the prism of justification by faith. Then everything makes clear. And our doctrines then become even more beautiful. Amen? This idea of the investigative judgment makes sense, but not that God is trying to see if we are worthy to be saved, because that's sometimes how it's presented, that this idea of this investigation is to see that if you are worthy or if you met the standards, amen? But that's not true, because we are saved by faith through grace, not of works, lest any man should boast. And sometimes it's hard for us to accept this concept, but my brothers and sisters, it brings freedom and liberty that you don't understand. You don't have to constantly be worried about your behavior, and your behavior is a response of your faith in this gift that God has given us in his son. Am I making myself clear today? I'm not teaching cheap grace. I am saying that there is nothing that sanctification can add to justification. Because justification is the perfect, may I repeat myself, it's the perfect character of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen? You ought to be jumping up and saying hallelujah at this time, because this is the truth as it is in Jesus. Amen? That Jesus, he is our everything. We stand on him. We are here because of him. We don't even deserve to be alive right now but for his grace. Amen? Come on, Elder. Come on, Elder. That's the reason why, brothers and sisters, you find out that when Moses, and I come back to this text, when Moses asked to see God, when he came to Moses and he introduced himself to him, the first thing that came out of God's mouth, amen, he says, the Lord, the Lord God, merciful and true, abundant in goodness and truth. That's the God that we serve. It's not an exacting God, amen? It's not a God who's constantly watching to see where we fail and the mistakes that we made. Yes, we make mistakes, brothers and sisters, and we err sometimes, but that doesn't mean that we have lost our connection with him. So as we look at the judgment, amen, we want to see the judgment in the light of justification by faith. Seems to me, okay? So we're going to examine, so I just, all this was just a foundation to be laid, how we arrived at this idea. So we will examine this pre-advent judgment, brothers and sisters, through the prism of righteousness by faith. For if we are saved by faith, and I quoted Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 through 9, for by grace, Ephesians chapter 2, Verses 8 and 9, the Bible says, For by grace you have been saved through what? Through faith. If you're there, when you're reading with me. And that not of yourselves, it is a what? It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Then what is the purpose of the judgment, like I said? Or rather, why are we judged since God knows who are his children? Amen? The answer, my friends, is not because God has to find out who among the saints are good enough to go to heaven, because sometimes that's how it appears to be when we, when we teach this doctrine. No, no, no. The answer is not because God is trying to find out who is good among us. The answer, really, the truth is that because if that's the case, then we are no longer saved by grace. Amen? Are you with me? Everybody's still following me, right? The reason Amen. For the investigative judgment, my friends, is because we are being accused day and night by the enemy of our soul. That is Satan. Revelation 12, verse 10. The Bible says he accuses us, what? Both day and night. So in the backdrop of the great controversy... I say we always need to look at our doctrines and our teachings in the backdrop of the great controversy. And that's one of the privileges that we have as Seventh-day Adventist Christians. We look at our teachings in the backdrop of this great controversy between God and Satan. And we know that the devil has accused God, right? That God is not just. He rebelled in heaven. That warfare is going on here on earth. And he declares that we are not worthy to be saved. And the truth is, we are not. For all have sinned and what? 
fell short of the glory of God. Isn't that so? Amen. And the Bible says that the wages of sin is what? The wages of sin is death. So we do deserve to die. But God came up with a plan. Praise his holy name. Amen. God came up with a plan, my Amen. friend. Next thing we got to study is the covenants and understand what the covenant is all about because we have the eternal covenant. This is an agreement, brothers and sisters, that was made within the Godhead before time existed. And they had already decided and they knew that sin was going to come. We say that sin did not caught God unawares. God knew it was going to come and he had a plan and he knew the sophisticated argument that the enemy would made, make concerning himself. And I said this before that what I've learned in my own experience is that when people say bad things about you and they try, try to discredit your character is it is not our place to defend ourselves by trying to discredit the source. <laughs> because God has taught us differently. Amen. You see, the first thing that we do when somebody speak bad things about us or they discredit us and they speak lies that are not true, the first thing that we try to do, I know it is true for myself, is that we try to defend ourselves by discrediting that individual or that source. Amen? That's but true. Amen. When we, but when we do yeah. that, when we do that, we do exactly what they're doing. We're just hearsay. We're just saying things. And you're either going to believe him or her, or you're going to believe me. So what God did, brothers and sisters, this is a beautiful concept that instead God knew this was going to come. He didn't deal with the devil that way. What God did, God came up with a plan. Amen. We call it Amen. a plan of redemption that he was going to show the universe. He was going to show his created beings who he was. And Amen. And determined within the Godhead that Jesus was going to be the one. Amen. Amen. And so we find in the plan of redemption now, this idea of righteousness by faith, that's what we really need to understand this, is God is saying to the universe, I'm going to save these people. No, they're not deserving, but the fact that they choose my plan. Amen. Amen. Heard the gospel, the good news. We chose, it, it's an it's a intellectual choice. See, we are saved not because of what we do, but because of the choice that we made. We chose right. to accept God's plan for us. Amen. To accept what he has done in the personage of Jesus on our behalf. And yes. that's the reason why we are saved into his eternal kingdom. Not because of anything that we've done, because really and truly the devil is right. Satan is right. We all deserve to die like him. Amen. Are you with me this morning, church? Yes, yes. I'm going to say something a little bit, and I want you to understand what I'm saying. Amen. Now, this is my own, because if you think about it, brothers and sisters, I'm going to go off here for a minute, but bear with me. Amen. If you think about it, I don't know if it has entered your mind, but it has entered my mind. Why is there a plan of salvation for mankind? What about the devil and his angels? Have you ever thought about that? Well, think about it, brothers and sisters. As I was thinking about this, I believe God has given me this, you know, in, in our own, in our own justice system, we have a term that is called a cruel and unusual punishment. You are familiar with that? Cruel and unusual punishment. And sometimes it, it comes up because, you know, you have a person who is young and we say they're immature and they're not fully developed and, and they commit some kind of crime and, you know, like a, a teenager and they're sentenced to life without parole. Our system say that that is cruel and unusual punishment because they were not mature enough. They were deceived by somebody who was older and they were, you know, they were carried away by the, the sophistry and the delusion of the person whose influence they were under. Well, we understand. We don't know everything, and I believe that God is going to give us more. There's something that God has not given us. The Bible says the things that are revealed belong to us and for our generation, and the secret things belong to God. But of course, we have these questions. So here we have, I believe, Lucifer and his angels. They want mature. You know, Lucifer stands next to the throne of God, and we are told in the context of the great controversy that God pleaded with him and his angels before they took that final step into oblivion, before they fully cast off their allegiance from God and committed themselves to the great controversy. 
so they had an opportunity when they when all this was going on when this was transpiring this satan you know dealing with his feelings and his jealousy uh, uh, about the godhead and, and the and the relationship that jesus had with his father and so there is no redemption for them but here you have adam and eve a young creation and the bible says that the woman was deceived so god have this plan the plan of redemption to redeem mankind but brothers and sisters the bible the we are told to the prophet of the Lord that the plan of redemption is more than just the redemption of human beings. The plan of redemption, the story of redemption is also about exonerating and vindicating the name of God. Amen. Throughout the universe so that everyone, every created being will understand that That's Satan right. was a liar. That's right. Amen? And that God is not this God that he paints. And how do we know that? Because throughout the scripture, we see this. This struggle going on where human beings are kind of, you know, we are deceiving to believe that God is this cruel person who is exacting, who is waiting just to hit us over the head when we make a mistake. And God is pleading with us to understand that that's not who he is. He is love, yeah. merciful, gracious, compassionate, Amen. Father. And that's why he presents himself as a father to us. Yes. So the reason for the investigative judgment, because we are being accused day and night by the enemy of our souls. Revelation 12 and verses 10. Amen. But brothers and sisters, we're going to be true biblical students, and we're going to stick to this method of exegesis of letting the Bible explain itself. The Bible says, see, we are quick as Seventh-day Adventist Christians to, to, to present to our evangelical friends when they believe in immortal soul and they go to the book, for example, when Paul says to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And we say, but no, 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 you just can't come up with an understanding of that one verse. It needs to be in the context of the entire word of God. The Bible says that the dead know not anything. The Bible says that the dead sleep in the dust of the earth, that they will hear his word at the end and God's going to resurrect them. It's all there in the word of God. So we say, our interpretation or understanding must be in the context of the entire word of God. But sometimes if we're not careful, we make the same mistakes that they make. So we look at the investigative judgment and we say, okay, everyone have to give an account. We look at the judgment, right, of the works that they've done in this body. Well, what about some text I'm going to throw at you right now? Come with me to the book of John. We're going to look at verses 24 through 29. What did I say? John 5, 24 to 29. I can't see nobody. All the pictures are gone. I'm not sure why, but hallelujah. If you can hear me, let somebody say amen. 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 So John chapter 5, verses 24 to 29. When you are there, let me hear you say amen. Somebody give me a clue here. Amen. We're all together. All right. So I'm going to start reading in verse 24. This is Jesus speaking, my friends. Now let's listen carefully because Jesus is speaking. And he starts out by saying it this way. Most assuredly. We ought to pay attention when Jesus said it, right? Most assuredly, he say, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes in him, God the Father, who sent me, has what? Everlasting life. Everlasting life. And shall not come into Condem judgment. Or some other translations say condemnation. But has what? But have passed from what? From yeah. death to into life. Verse 25. Most assuredly I say to you the hour is coming and now is when what? When the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will what? Will live. For as the Father has life in himself, so, has he, so he has granted the Son to have life in himself and has given him authority to execute the judgment. Now we read in Acts chapter, uh, what was that we read? Uh, Acts, Acts uh, 1731, that God has committed judgment to Jesus. Amen. So here, the, the text, they are, they are agreement with each other. He said God has given him authority to execute the judgment also because he is what? Because he is the son of man. 
Do not marvel at this, for the hour is coming in which all who are in the graves will hear his voice and come forth, those who have done good to the resurrection of life, and those who have done evil to the resurrection of damnation, condemnation. So my friends, let's try and break this down, right? We cannot ignore the statement. So in the context of righteousness by faith and the investigative judgment, I personally have no choice but to say that I believe actually Jesus was here declaring righteousness by faith in connection also with the judgment. So remember that a trial has what? Three phases. We have the trial, the verdict, and the execution of the verdict. In the judgment, the verdict is either what? It's everlasting life or what? Everlasting death. Am I right? But so if you really think about what Jesus is saying there, he says, when you are declared righteous, he says, if you believe my word and you believe him who sent me, you have passed from death to life. Amen. Righteousness by faith, brothers and sisters. By believing and accepting God's plan, Jesus said, you have now been judged because God judged you on this basis and he has now granted you eternal life. Everlasting life is awarded the saints at the second coming, brothers and sisters, while the death sentence for the wicked is carried out after the millennium. Where do we get that from? Revelation 20, verses 4 through 6. You want to turn with me there? Revelation 20, verses 4 through 6. This is for those who are not familiar with our doctrines to understand how we pull all this together. Amen? The Bible says in Revelation chapter 20, verses 4 through 6, it says, And I saw a throne, and they that sat on them, and judgment was committed to them. Then I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus and for the word of God, who had not worshipped the beast or his image, and not received his mark on their foreheads or on their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. Verse 5. But the rest of the dead did not live again until the thousand years were finished. This is how we understand and know that at the second coming, only those who are in Christ are going to be raised. And the dead in Christ shall rise first, Thessalonians tell us. Comfort one another with these words. Amen. Those who are alive will be caught up. The dead in Christ shall be raised first. The Bible says, and then the rest of the dead live not again until the thousand years was finished. Here's another thing. We're not talking about this today, but this is another difference that we have with our evangelical friends when it comes to the millennium. Most of them teach that the millennium is going to be a thousand years of peace on earth. According to the word of God, there'll be nobody alive during the millennium because everybody, the Bible says that when Jesus come, 2 Thessalonians verse, chapter 1, verses 7 to 8, the Bible says that the wicked are slain by the brightness of his coming. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 7 to 8, tells us that the wicked are slain by the brightness of his coming. Amen? Amen. So there's nobody left alive. The Bible tells us in the Old Testament that there's a time when the, the, the earth is going to be void and without form and that there will be bodies all over the place and there will be none to bury or none to mourn. Why? Because everybody is dead. And the Bible says that God, and, uh, we're not here to do that today, but I'm just throwing some text at you, brothers and sisters. The word of God says that at this time, God is going to call all the birds and they're going to be a great feast. Why? Because they're going to feast on the dead bodies that are strewn all over the world. Amen. The Bible says that the great cities are going to be broken down by the presence of the Lord and his fierce anger. Amen. That's the second coming, brothers and sisters. Amen. So we are in sync here. So we have here, the Bible says, but the dead live not, but the rest of the dead did not live again until a thousand years was finished, verse 5. This is the first resurrection, meaning those who were resurrected prior to the millennium. The Bible says, blessed and holy is he who has part in the first resurrection. Over such, the second death has no power. But they shall be priests of God and Christ and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. So brothers and sisters, the Bible is very clear. The executing of the judgment is everlasting life or eternal death, the second death after the millennium. 
So when Jesus says that you have passed from death to life, that is what he is declaring right there. Righteousness by faith. You are saved. Again, I'm going to repeat myself just in case you're not hearing me right. You are saved and you're going to be in God's eternal kingdom. And we are going to be standing on the sea of glass, brothers and sisters, not because we are being justified, but we are being sanctified rather, but because we have been justified. Sanctification, I said justification is justified is what we are. By the way, the word for justifica justified is the same word in the Greek that's, trans that's translated to be righteous. So to be justified is to be declared righteous. Ephesians says we were chosen to be holy and blameless before him in love. We have to get that, brothers and sisters. So yes, the investigative judgment is something that is real, but it's not to prove or to see if we are worthy of eternal life, but to show that we are. Are you with me this morning? Or I should say this afternoon. So let's follow this through, right? If the verdict is life or death, and Jesus declared that if you believe my word, and him, God the Father, who sent me, Jesus, has everlasting life, and shall not come into judgment, would have passed from death to life, this is righteousness by faith, right, right, my friends? What is the, so what is the word that you believe? The everlasting gospel. The good news that God has given his son, Jesus, as a propitiation for our sins, now he extends the gift of eternal life to those who accept his plan. So how does this sink in with the investigative judgment or the pre-advent judgment? It's about vindication, my brothers and sisters. Vindication means the action of clearing someone of blame or suspicion. See, we're constantly under suspicion because the Bible says that the enemy of our souls accuses us day and night that we are not worthy to receive the gift of God, which is eternal life. We see that the enemy of our souls who have cast suspicion on the people of God, since in the sanctification process, brothers and sisters, we stumble at times, he no doubt tries to accuse us of being unworthy. We stumble, we make mistakes. How can you save these folks, amen? Jesus as our high priest, brothers and sisters, ministers his final atonement, vindicate us not because of any good works that we have done on our own behalf, but because we have taken our stand with God and chose him as Savior and Lord. The works or deeds, I want you to listen very carefully, my friends. The works or deeds that come up are up are our acts of faith. Did you, did you get that right? Did you get that? The works or deeds that come up are acts of faith, which are but fruits of the Holy Spirit. So the works that we now work, brothers and sisters, is not to gain salvation, but it's a response of the ministry of the Holy Spirit in our life. The Bible says the mystery, God in us, right? I mean, amen. Christ in us, the hope of glory. Jesus saves us because we chose him, and then he comes into our life, and then he works out our salvation. It is God, the Bible says, Philippians chapter 2, verses 13. It says, the works of the deeds, so with the, let me start over again. The works or deeds that come up are acts of faith, which are but fruits of the Holy Spirit. For, the Bible says, it is God who works in you both to will and to do his good pleasure. Philippians chapter 2, verses 13. Paul says over and over, not I, but Christ who works in us. I'm going to close with this text. And it's found in, I believe it's Zechariah chapter 2, chapter 1. Let me see if I get my stuff right here. Are you still with me, church? Yes, yes. The Bible says, Then he showed me Joshua the high priest. Before I read, read this text, brothers and sisters. You see, we have to really and truly understand. And, I, and, I, and, I, and I've been talking to, to my Adventist friends that I have and, and a lot of people who are 
and, and, I, and I say this with kindness, but a lot of us who are especially connected with this, what we term as present truth, and, and sanctification is just hype all the time and, and the health message. And yes, all these things are true and all these things are right. And we ought to, that ought to be, you know, our aspirations to, to eat healthy because the Bible says that our body is a healthy, is the temple of the Holy Spirit and that we are holy and that we were purchased not with corruptible things, but with the precious blood of the Son of God. So yes, our helpful eating and drinking is important. It's more than that, you know, it's, it's, it's a holistic view. It's we sleep and our exercise and we just can't focus on one and, and be neglectful of the other. But the truth is, brothers and sisters, it doesn't matter how good you eat. It doesn't matter if you're a vegan. That doesn't make you more savable to God. Amen. And we have to understand this. We have to hold on to this. You see? Now, here is something that I find, right? And this is ridiculous. I mean, it's so... I'm trying to... I'm trying to reach for the right word, brothers and sisters. You know, when people who are into the health thing, you know, when you invite them to eat and, you know, and if they come to your home and, and, and they were like, well, is it vegan? Um, yeah, it's vegan. Uh, but then they want to know some, how do you, how do you cook it? What kind of oil you use? I was talking to somebody who was there to me and I said, listen, if you're going to go to somebody's home and they're fellow believers and they're not going to serve you meat, Amen. And alcohol or anything that you know may disrupt your Zen, then I say if they offer you food and if you're hungry, you eat it. It's not gonna kill you, it's not gonna make you Amen. less savable, it's not gonna let make you less holy. Amen. But you see, Amen. when you start when you start saying, yeah. Is it vegan? How did you cook it? Right away there, you see that legalistic mentality because what you're saying is that, well, I don't eat that because that's below me. I am up here, you are down there. See, you're still eating, oh, veg right. you're just eating vegetarian. Okay. Okay. I, I, am, I am vegan. Yeah, yeah, I agree. That's a legalistic mentality, brothers and sisters. You are not saved. The Bible says Jesus is very clear. See, the Pharisees, they were good at this stuff. They were washing and doing all this stuff. And Jesus had to tell them, it is not what enters into a man that defiles him, but it's what comes out. All right now. It's from yeah, the issues of the more. heart. Can a bitter spring bring forth sweet water? It doesn't matter how much vegan and, and kosher and food you eat. That will not change your bitter spring into sweet water. Amen. I'm afraid I got to tell you the truth as it is in Jesus. Amen. Amen. It's not going to give you a better attitude. That comes from surrendering, my friends, mm. to the Holy Spirit in our lives. We preach it. You're not going to become more compassionate because you, you're vegan and you don't eat meat. Well, help us, Lord. And believe me, don't walk away and say that Elder Dissident is advocating uh, eating meat. Because I'm not. I believe that there's a time when we need to move away from these things. We have to follow the counsels of God. Amen? Yes. That our bodies are indeed a temple of the Holy Spirit. And God will destroy those who are destroying this temple that he paid such a dear price for. But let's put... Of the distance, you're frozen. Dave. Mm. Dave.
Okay, beloved, let's um thank you for the word, Dave. We'll move on just now. He said he's trying to get back on, just give him a second or two. Okay. Can everybody hear me? Yes. Okay, so I'm just gonna wrap up using Brother Rancher on the phone because we lost our connection here at the church. So here is the last text I'm sharing with you, brothers and sisters. The Bible says, Zechariah, then he showed me Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord and Satan standing at his right hand to oppose him. And the Lord said to Satan, the Lord rebuke you, Satan. The Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. Is this not a brand plucked from the fire? Yes, my brothers and sisters. Yes, my friends. That's exactly what we all are, a brand plucked from the fire. Yeah. Let us pray. Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you again for the privilege of knowing you the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you sent. For this you have declared to us as eternal life, to know thee. Lord, we pray that you will give us understanding and wisdom as we contemplate these very crucial points, Lord, in our doctrinal beliefs of the investigative judgment and how we're saved, that we were fully persuaded that we are saved, not because of what we do, but because of the choice that we have made to accept Jesus as Lord and Savior. And that our sanctification comes because the fact that we have been justified in him and it's the Holy Spirit who works in us both to will and to do thy good pleasure. Thank you for being our God and our friend. Thank you for the Sabbath day that you've set aside for us to rest and to rest in the assurance of Jesus, our Christ. We ask these blessings, O oh Father, and we thank you for hearing our prayer. For we ask it in Jesus' holy name. Let the church say amen. Amen. Amen.